All right. So, first two, gravitational electromagnetic force, which we've studied and learned about already. The next two are strong, strong forces and weak forces. In physics, you go into that a little bit further in depth, but in this case, strong forces exist between any kind of, yeah, come on in. I cut it off. You can cut it back on and see if it's working. Um, I cut it off. It was just flickering. I don't know if it was an over, overheating issue or whatever. But it, it was giving me the image and then going off, come back on. Um, so strong forces are forces in between any types of nucleons, right? So nucleons are protons and neutrons, right? Protons and neutrons have a interaction, right? We, we've already determined that they're extremely small, right? So the gravitational force between them shouldn't be large at all. It should be very, very minuscule. Positive and neutrally charged things shouldn't have an electromagnetic interaction. But since these stay inside of the nucleus and we know that they interact with each other, the naming of that was then when it was found out it was called strong forces and that interacts between nucleons, right? So nucleons are protons and neutrons. That's one of the definitions that we, uh, we're we going to talk about. Now a nuclide is specifically an atom with a designated number of protons and neutrons. So helium-4 is a particular nuclide. It might have just needed a restart. I cut it off. I didn't restart it, but... Oh, the cables, it was cool, appreciate it. So. All right, thank you. Was it doing it as soon as you cut it on? Or? Yeah, it did, it did as soon as I cut it on. It looks good now. I think we're good. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm, I'm here till 5.30. Okay, so I'll take that towards you. All right, appreciate it. Um, this is a particular nuclide, the nuclide we're looking at here, helium-4. So, from a definition standpoint, nuclide is an atom with a specific number of proton neutron. Nucleons are those protons and neutrons or the particles within the nucleus that we are interested in. The strong forces are what hold them together. Protons interact with protons, neutrons interact with neutrons, and protons interact with neutrons. So there's three different types of interactions going on all at once. Now, we should know from General Chemistry 1 that not all atoms of a particular element have the same mass. Because neutrons differ, and those neutrons differ, you know, from here to there. And there are three naturally occurring isotopes of this particular element that they want to look at, which is uranium, right? And uranium, 234, 35, and 238. Some things have 10 isotopes. Some things have two isotopes. Right? It just depends on the particular element. And during this chapter, you are going to be given and working specifically with a particular nuclide, usually. So, radioactivity. When you hear radioactivity, most people think, oh, you know, radioactivity is not good for you, right? We hear that it causes cancer. It has some implications in biology, energy. Right? People sing about it. I think they're songs about this stuff, and I'm sure they don't know what it is. But radioactivity is when the nuclide or nuclei spontaneously change. And when I say change, generally speaking, we call that a uh, I just had a blank. We call that um, a decay. Excuse me. So if it spontaneously decays, then we consider that nuclei radioactive. If we are dealing with an element that has nuclides which are radioactive, we consider these radionuclides and radioisotopes of a particular element. So radioisotopes are atoms containing radionuclides such as uranium and radionuclides are nuclides that are radioactive. So, of the three that we just saw up here, these three are all radioactive. So they are all radionuclides, and uranium is a particular radioisotope. What was the definition of you? Radionuclides definition is a nuclide that is radioactive. 
and a radioisotope is an atom containing radionuclides such as uranium would be one. And these nuclides or these radioisotopes, these particular atoms have multiple ways of decay or multiple ways of this spontaneous emission of radiation. And we use nuclear equations to kind of figure that out. We use nuclear equations to figure that out. Before we get to nuclear equations, we want to go back to a little bit of, of kind of general chemistry and physics, and we're going to talk a little bit about, they, they kind of go in a little weird order here, but we're going to talk a little bit more about the strong force and energy before we get into the actual uh, equations themselves. So if we go to the nuclear stability slide a little bit further into the PowerPoint, you'll see that any atom will have some repulsion between the protons, right, because any atom that has two or more. Strong nuclear force is what I talked about that keeps them together, but neutrons are very important in stabilizing the nucleus. So the ratio of, pro of neutrons to protons is important, meaning that N over P plus is equal to a ratio. And that ratio is important for stability. And when we talk about stability, we talk about whether the atom is going to decay, is going to be radioactive, and to what degree and to what pathway. So this is an important chart. You will probably, I will probably print this chart on the exam. You have this as a function of the PowerPoint and in the text, but this chart gives you what is known as the band of stability as it pertains to particular atoms on the periodic table. I will probably print this on the back side of the exam so that you can have it. What it shows is that as you increase the atomic number of a given, oh, as you increase the atomic number on the periodic table, as you go up in number of protons, we see that you need more and more neutrons to keep those protons stable, to keep that nucleus stable. As you see way down here at the bottom, number of protons are almost equal to number of neutrons and you start to see that band of stability change and the stability ends up needing more and more neutrons. So up until about, I think, uh, 20, right, like they said, up until 20, you're going to see most of your stable nuclei are a one-to-one -one ratio, right? If you look at oxygen, 16, right? It's eight and eight. You look at nitrogen, 14, seven and seven. But as you get beyond 20, you start to see that change because you look at calcium, and calcium is 20 and 41. Uh, but then if you go into the transition metals, and I don't, let me use this one because I, I don't know why they moved there. If you go into transition metals, you see iron is 55, 56, and 26. So we're getting a little bit higher than one to one. So you're going to need more neutrons. So that's very important conceptually to understand if somebody was to ask you, why is it that silver has a higher neutron to proton ratio than beryllium, right? And you can explain that as nuclei get larger, it takes more neutrons to stabilize the nucleus to space out, essentially you got to think about it in three-dimensional space. As you put more neutrons in there, you kind of space them out, right? You can kind of think of it as, you know, uh, I kind of think of it like back in the day, and I don't even know if they do this anymore, they used to have little plastic balls at like McDonald's or something, right? And it was a little thing that the kids, you jump in the ball. That's the kind of the same thing. If you didn't want the red balls, let's say, to touch one another or to be close to one another, you would put more yellow balls in there. Right? And that's the same concept here. More nuclei, uh, more neutrons in the nucleus, you spread out the red balls a little bit more or you spread out the protons a little bit more and that will stabilize things. Now, given an example, you should be able to find where it exists on the band of stability and go from there as to how or whether it's stable or not. And we're going to get to some questions on that a little bit later. But specifically, wanted to talk about the energy part of this. So 
Einstein's E equals MC squared holds true for everything. That's why it's such a big deal. That's why he got, you know, such a claim for this. But within a particular nucleus, there is energy stored as a function of the mass. And as a function of the mass, times the speed of light, we can determine how much energy. Now, if we look at the energy of one of us, we see that that value, not that big, right? But if we look at the energy of one of these nuclei, it's way, way larger. So there's something, uh, and we're not going to do the change just yet, but we're going to talk about, first thing I want to talk about is mass defect, which is the third question. The mass of the nucleus itself is less than those of the individual parts, and it's tough to talk about that. It's tough to wrap our head around that because up until this point, we have disregarded any kind of mass changes in chemical reaction. We have said the law, I've always preached the law of conservation of mass, right? We've always talked in stoichiometry that if you start with 100 grams or something, you have to end up with that 100 grams. As it pertains to chemical reactions, we don't lose that much mass over the course of those transitions. But as it pertains to nuclear stuff going on, we actually do lose mass. And that mass defect, because the energy change is so large, that it actually matters. It matters. So the mass difference is called the mass defect, and the energy needed to kind of break apart the nucleus is known as the nuclear binding energy, right? The nuclear binding energy. So um, I don't know if they give an example question. No, they don't, and that's why I have this question here. So this question asks about determine the mass defect and binding energy of fluorine 19 in megavolts per nucleus, and then we want to look at it per nucleon. So now we get into the math of nuclear chemistry. So fluorine 19, what is fluorine 19? Well, first thing, it is a isotope, right? It is a nuclide. And it starts UO, fluorine, 19. And it has a total of nine protons and 10 neutrons. How do we know that? Fluorine's atomic number nine, that is never going to change as a function of identity of the atom, right? We know that from general chemistry. One. Okay. And it has nine electrons. How do we know it has nine electrons? It is in the ground state, same number of protons, right? Okay, so the mass of the, the mass um, of a particular fluorine atom, right, fluorine 19, I have to give you that, and it is actually uh, very similar to what is on the periodic table, 18.998, I think. What's on your reference material? 18.998? Yeah, 18.998. And remember, this is AMU. So for a lot of our uh, calculations in this chapter, we're going to be using AMUs. So what we need to do mathematically is we need to calculate for this particular nuclide if scientists have told us that this is the mass of the actual atom, then we need to look at what the different parts of the atom add up to be and see what that difference is, right? And if we can determine what that difference is, we can determine what is known as the mass defect and then calculate the energy. So where do we get these values from? Now, this is where we need to use the reference material. This is from the National Institute of Standards. NIST, NIST gives us the mass in atomic mass units of a proton, electron, and a neutron, right? And we need to use all of those values. Uh, pretty standard to use five significant digits for each of these. So, mass of the proton is going to be 1.0073 AMU. Mass of the neutron is going to be 1.0087 AMU. And electron is going to be nine times 5.4858 times 10 to the negative four. AMU, all right? And I'm doing this math just to kind of speed it up, but realize that you need to be able to recognize in this type of problem that you need to go to the reference material and get the total atomic mass units for the nuclide that of interest 
and you're going to see that this value does not equal the value that was given to us, right? So, if we go and calculate the total mass of F19 fluorine or 19 over 9, we're going to see that that value gives us 19.1571. It's larger, and that's what we should expect. In these problems, we should expect it to be larger because I just told you the masses of the nuclei are less than those of the individual parts because the interaction of them loses mass, and that mass is converted to energy using E equals mc squared. So, where, when did that conversion happen? So that's the question, right? This doesn't just happen randomly. That conversion had to occur when each individual atom of each individual element was made. So, right? So, depending on, you know, whatever your theory of existence is, right? One theory is that Big Bang occurs, huge amounts of energy, all the protons and neutrons are organized into the individual atoms, into the individual isotopes in that one event. And the energy that was released is why it was considered a big bang because we're, what we're gonna see is the energy of this just little teeny mass defects is huge. So what happens when all of the atoms, of all the elements that make up Earth occurred and were created in one shot? So now that we know the mass, we need to get the difference in mass. And to get the difference in mass, we do a basic subtraction. 18.998 AMU gives us 0 0.15867. And you can verify that via calculator. Well, I did some of these before, so I wouldn't have to be up here punching about the number. Okay, now, what we should remember, again, this is going back to some general chemistry, and a lot of people argue that this actually should be taught in general chemistry one because we're covering a lot of the same stuff. But this is kind of a throwback. So remember AMU, we also can utilize in terms of grams per mole, right? That's what we do on the periodic table when we're converting mass to number of moles. So we can actually keep that relationship here as we talk about the mass defect. So now we have a mass defect of this many grams per mole. But we have been asked for the mass defect and the binding energy. So the mass defect we have calculated. That's here. So this is mass defect. Just so that everybody's clear. The mass defect is in fact a mass. Any questions up to this point? Simple subtraction, really. This is simple multiplication, addition, subtraction. Okay, but now the binding energy a little bit different. Binding energy a little bit different. And I'm going to erase this because I'm going to try to keep all this stuff in one spot for the video. All right. And on the homework, you're going to have some more examples of these, of course. So if we know that the mass defect is in grams per mole, then we can determine the energy. in joules per mole using c squared times delta m, right? E equals mc squared, or the change in mass. Mass or the change in mass is both still valid in this particular equation. So if we look at c squared, which is on our reference material as 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and we know the mass defect in grams per mole now. Which is 0 0.15867 grams per mole. We end up with a value of 
1.428 times 10 to the 16, I think. Double check this. That's right, okay. And this is going to be in units of grams, meter squared over second squared mole, okay. If you look at your reference material, I'm pretty sure this is on your reference materials. And if not, you will be given this in your... You'll be given this uh, conversion, but we should remember that one joule, and I'll have to give this to you. I don't know why that's not on there. One joule is one kilogram per meter squared, second squared, and we can't get to electron volts, which is also on our reference to We can't get to electron volts, which is what was asked of us, without getting this in a kilogram. So this is going to be equal to 1.428 times 10 to the 13th kilograms meter squared over second squared per mole. And since this unit is joules, we now have 1.428 times 10 to the 13 joule per mole. Okay? If you look at where is that value? And this number is binding energy in joules per mole. Now I threw, threw in, and I like this problem of milli uh, megavolts per nucleus or mega EV per nucleus because it brings in a different uh, value, but we were asked per nucleus. So, to get this from joules per mole, right, to joules per atom, what must we do to convert this? How do we go from moles to atoms? Right, Avogadro's number here. So, we're multiplying this, excuse me, multiplying this by the inverse or dividing this by Avogadro's number. So, here we have a division by Avogadro's number. One mole over 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, or in this case, you can be specific and say nuclei. And this is going to give us joules per nucleus. And I think this number is 2.3722 times 10 to the negative 11 joules per nucleus. Okay, now, and again, this is still, we're still in energy nucleus. Now we're in energy nucleus, right? We were in energy in joules per mole. Now we're in energy based on one nucleus. Now we want to get EV. So again, if you were given this kind of problem, you would be given any kind of reference material you need or constant, and if this is in joule per nucleus, this would be multiplied by one joule is 1.602 
times 10 to the negative 19 electron volts. And again, this value I would have to give to you. I thought it was on the reference for true. That's not. No, it's not. And now, just the math of this gives us energy of the nucleus in electron volts is equal to 1480780000 EV per nucleus. And then to put that in mega, right, we move this decimal six places. So the actual answer to the question is 148 MEV per nucleus. So that is the binding energy in the units as for. Doesn't matter what I ask you for. Joules per mole, joules per nucleus, kilojoules per nucleus. And now, this is per nucleus, and the last thing that I ask in here is the energy per nucleon, which means the energy per individual proton and or neutron, which means that we got to take that value, 148 mega EV over 19 nucleon, right? Because nucleons, this is nucleons per nucleus, right? Technically, right? Since this is millivolts per nucleus, I don't want you to get confused with the units, but technically, that's this. And that number ends up giving you, what, 7.8-ish, 7.79. This is a lot of energy per mole. And we're talking about just individual atoms have that much as huge. So this is going to be MeV per nucleon. Just be sure to be careful with your units, right? Careful with your units. So this is walking through mass defect portion, which is simple. And honestly, binding energy is simple. Really, this one was kind of made a little more complex mathematically because they were throwing at you conversion, unit conversions, which at this point we better be extremely comfortable with. Joules, kilojoules, and utilization of any constant that has been given to you. Any questions about that before we move on? Okay. So, we talked about the band of stability and atoms that aren't in that band of stability are, are going to undergo some kind of decay because they are unstable. And we are going to, we normally represent them utilizing nuclear equations. So just like chemical equations, you have the balance and the right amount of moles, the stoichiometry. We do the same thing with nuclear equations except we are focused on the nuclear components. We are focused on the numbers of nucleons. So the atomic number and mass number have to balance on each side of the equation. This is how we balance mass number on the atomic scale, right? Charge and mass number. We're not so, so much worried about the overall charge of the atom itself as far as electrons are concerned. We're more concerned with protons and neutrons. So there are different types of radiation that we get from decay. Alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha radiation has a charge of the entire particle of 2 plus. It has a mass given here as a function of its nucleons and it penetrates not so much and it's actually the nucleus of a helium atom. So alpha and helium are the same and you're going to see that. So whenever you see that, this is equivalent to 4HE 
2. So helium 4 alpha. Technically, there is a 2 plus up here, but it is not important. You won't see that written in the majority of your examples. But technically, it's a 2 plus up there. Okay, beta radiation is equal to an electron. And it is written this way. Now, realize that this negative one is in the atomic number, so it, it represents a lessening of a proton, but again, you can't technically have a negative number of protons, but that is how it is represented. And gamma radiation is actually just high energy photons, it's high energy light waves. So gamma radiation is photons, and you will not see gamma radiation impact the mass number or the atomic number. So you may see gamma radiation listed like this, zero, zero. So there are a couple different types of decay. Five of them that we'll talk about, uh, specifically four of them have equations that you may see and you will see actually, and we're going to go over a couple of those examples here. So you have alpha decay, beta decay, gamma emission, positron emission, and electron capture. So alpha decay or alpha emission is the emission of a helium 2 plus by radioactivity and radioactive decay. So the example that I gave you, it, it asks you to use thorium-228 and let it undergo an alpha decay, decay process. So if we find thorium on periodic table, we see thorium is near the bottom. It's in the uh, actinides, which is number 90. So we have TH90 and the 228 is the particular isotope. So if it decays and it emits, meaning it gives off, then that means that the alpha particle needs to be on the right side of the equation. You will see me generally write this as 4, 2, you may see it written as just the alpha particle, but realize when you write it like this, it gives you a, a it makes it easier for you to keep track of the numbers, right? So the total on the right side has to equal 228 as a mass number, and it has to equal 90 as the atomic number, which means that this needs to be 224, and this number needs to be 88. Once you get those values, what you're going to see is you're going to have to go back to the periodic table and look for the particular element that corresponds with 88 and that element is radon, pretty sure. Sorry, radium, excuse me, radon, radium. I always get those confused. So this ends up being radium. So this is an example of alpha decay. Simple. I mean, this is, this is basic. Really, I need folks to realize that when it comes to alpha decay, and points on assessment. You do not want to be losing points here. This is, this is a basic math puzzle, effectively. As soon as you see alpha decay, you got to just know that it is helium 4-2. That's it for that question. Now, this alpha decay occurs generally, and we're going to talk about this, we're going to get back to this again, generally happens for large nucleus. Right? Look at thorium, big nucleus, 228 alpha decay to try to bring down the size of the nucleus and also try to bring down the neutron to proton ratio, right? Neutron to proton ratio decreases. So this case they used uranium to thorium, right? And if uranium decomposes or decays to thorium, this would be maybe a second decay that occurred for thorium into helium, right? Now, any question to alpha decay? Real simple. Two protons, two neutrons. 
Okay, beta decay, you may see again listed as beta with a zero negative one or little e, zero negative one. I usually tend to write little e just to not make sure not get confused. So, uh, for the example that I gave you, I gave you thallium 208, beta decay. So, 208, thallium is TL. If you look on the periodic table, I think it is 81. 81. 81. So, here, we need to realize that we're emitting an electron or beta particle, high speed electron specifically. Therefore, we need this negative one added to 82 to get 81. And since the zero doesn't impact the uh, mass number, here we are looking at creation of lead. 82, or lead 208. So we have added a proton by emitting a beta particle. So essentially, we have lost energy from the nucleus and turned effectively what is an electron into a proton. That's what has effectively occurred. Straightforward beta emission. Now, gamma emission is the loss of a gamma ray, which is extremely dangerous, high energy radiation that accompanies the loss of a particle. So, a lot of times when these emissions occur, there's also potentially gamma emission radiated as well. It just depends on the particular element and depends on how high energy that transition is. But gamma emission uh, examples, uh, I think they showed um, a situation on one of the other examples where high energy hydrogen undergoes gamma emission. Uh, here's one for those that are um, used to, or those that are familiar with radiation therapies in the healthcare system. Cobalt 60 is actually a very, very unstable nuclei, nucle, nuclei, excuse me, and it doesn't undergo decay in either one of these methods, it actually undergoes gamma decay, giving off gamma rays. So when uh, they're trying to destroy cancer cells, a lot of the therapies, uh, one of the therapy types is using this particular nuclide of cobalt. So they try to find it, they try to isolate this one, and then they use cobalt specifically to emit that gamma radiation and kill the cells, because we know gamma radiation penetrates through your body. Very dangerous. Notice that nothing changed except the overall energy of the nucleus itself, not the uh, protons and neutrons. All right, positron emission is emitting a positron, which is a particle that is an electron, is the same size, but it is not negatively charged. So, we have emission of a positron, which is another type of particle that nobody's heard of up until this point. Just realize that it is the emission of a positron. So, it's essentially turning a proton into an electron, kind of, if you think of it that way. Again, the real scope of what's happening here is kind of beyond the scope of this class. You get into your upper level physics, they'll talk about this a little bit more, and upper level nuclear chem. So, the example that I gave you is oxygen going through positron emission, emission oxygen 15 specifically, means that we're going to be losing a positron, or you may see it shown as beta positive. You may see that B with a positive charge instead of B with a negative charge. And positron emission here gives you a nitrogen molecule. 
straightforward. Um, you know, this is really a conversion here of a proton into a neutron and releasing energy. That's really what it is. Okay. Electron capture, which is the last type, and it, this is where an electron from the electron cloud is actually captured inside of the nucleus, changing the uh, nucleus and converting um, one of the protons. And our example, uh, I keep looking at this one. We're not doing rubidium. We're doing mercury 201. So we got mercury 201, 80 Hg plus an electron capture, which is still a, very similar to a beta particle. Electron capture uses that same thing. And we end up with 201 and go. Excuse me, 79, not 99. So, those are your three. So, in this case, so right, this is the conversion of a proton to a neutron. Here, we have the conversion of a proton to a neutron, but the proton is getting the, this high energy electron capture, the proton couples with the electron to convert into a neutron. So that is what is occurring here. Because notice, what does not change? Mass number, but if the atomic number changes, then what has to occur? A neutron has to be added, right? So that's what's occurring at the, like, the inner energy level. And I'm not so, so worried about understanding that. I would suggest that everybody go back and read, do some reading in this chapter, because outside of the math, the reading is the best thing to help you kind of understand these processes. But each one of these different processes will occur for unstable nuclides, which one occurs is a function of band stability, which we're going to go back to. Um, in question five. So let's take a look back at our band of stability and let's talk about question five. So in each of these, I ask you to look at neutron proton ratio, which is a simple calculation, which is based on a function of the mass number. So Let's take a look at tritium, right? Hydrogen 3, right? It's called tritium, but you could also call it hydrogen 3. Hydrogen 3 mostly exists way, way, way up in the atmosphere where the hydrogen particles are colliding with other stuff, creating larger uh, hydrogen nuclei, nuclei. Let's look at the neutron to proton ratio. You'll see me write it like this, or you can write it like this. Is equal to what? It's equal to two divided by one, based on the mass number, which means that the neutron to proton ratio is two. Simple, simple enough. Simple enough. Now. We're supposed to be close to one to one, and that makes sense why we don't see a lot of tritium, right? It's not a very abundant isotope. We got very little percentage of that in our mix of elements because it undergoes decay, and that decay specifically, in this case, is going to be a function of positron emission, uh, excuse me, above the belt 
excuse me, because we're above this belt, it's going to be beta decay for small atoms that have a ratio above the belt, which is one to one where it should be, right? We're one to one at hydrogen, but we're above the belt because our ratio is two to one. So therefore, we're going to undergo beta decay, and beta decay in this case is going to look like what? I'm going to use multiple different types just to get you familiar with it. Beta particle emitted, which is going to bring us to a helium-3. Conversion of a neutron into a proton and the releasing of the energy. High particle electron. That's what's being released. Now, why the why here, which I always like to ask the why, because we have a neutron and proton ratio that is too high for the particular Z value, right? Too high. So we're above the belt of stability in our case looking at this chart. And you can verify that by putting you a dot on the graph. Okay, what about polonium 245? So, we got 245 PU and that is 94. And I'm going to go get me some more markers. Plutonium, not polonium, plutonium. Now let's take a look at the ratio. One ninety five. Excuse me, one fifty one over ninety four. Now this value is equal to 1.6, 1.6. But we are at a value above 84. So based on that, the dominant decay mode above 84, anything in this area, you pretty much don't have any stable nuclei past 84. So all your elements on the periodic table past 84 are unstable. They are going to be radioactive. They are going to emit something which is why people say heavy metal. You ever hear people say you don't want to have any heavy metal in your water. You don't want to be interacting with heavy metal, right? We're not talking about not only just the bad music, we're talking about science. Radioactive. So plutonium should undergo alpha decay or alpha emission. And we just talked about that. So alpha emission is 4-2. You might see alpha particle, you might see HE, either one is fine. And that's going to give you 241, 92, and that is uranium. Why large nucleus, unstable, alpha decay is going to be the dominant decay mode, what you would expect to occur. Just basic math at this point. And then lastly, calcium 38. So let's talk about what if it's not a heavy metal, right? Neutron to proton ratio is equal to 18 over 20. I don't think I did that. Zero point nine. Okay. So 
if it's below the belt, right, which is generally one to one, dominant mode is going to be positron emission or electron capture. So we could have two of them occur, right? So let's say positron emission looks like this plus 38 over 19 uh, potassium and electron capture is zero over negative one, which gives us 38 over 19, right? Same product, but maybe different route of nuclear radiation. Now, if you were told that it was stable, then none of this would happen, right? But in each of these situations, I was telling you that they are not, right? Um, the assumption is that they're not stable. Okay. Any questions up until this point on the first page? Nuclear reactions. You're going to get plenty of examples of these in the homework. One step. Again, all these are one step, but this is not always the case. And we're going to see that next. When we talked about, when scientists started looking at all this nuclear energy, they started looking at nuclear reactions, they started to see, man, what we expected to be made in these singular processes is not what we see happening. So, therefore, almost all of your large nucleus, radioactive nuclides, end up going through what is known as a decay chain, which means that we have multiple nuclear reactions all occurring in kind of a chain reaction. As soon as one occurs, the next atom or the next nuclide that's formed is actually unstable as well. So it's particularly looking at this situation, this uranium nuclide, we know uranium is too big. We know it's going to undergo something next. And then it almost always undergoes these until it gets to lead. Lead is one of the uh, nuclides that is very stable, which is one of the reasons why we use lead, right? Lead in a lot of uh, situations where we need it to be strong, not react with anything. Lead is extremely stable. So there are particular nuclides of lead that are non-reactive, non-radioactive, and that's usually what the process occurs. So if you look up there, each of these different processes on the board is an alpha decay or beta emission. And it takes, what is that, it looks like 10 or 11, 13 transitions maybe to get you all the way to lead. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do all that over and over and over again because it's, it's kind of redundant. But in the case of the question that I gave you, let's look at polonium-218 from uranium-238. So I'm giving you the starting and the ending. All you have to do is show the process in between, which is five transitions of Alpha, beta, beta, alpha, alpha, alpha. Okay? So, uranium 238 is first. And we said, and each of these is alpha. And now this is just reference material 92. So, this is 90, 234 which is the radion thallium thorium, excuse me. Then thorium undergoes beta decay. This particular nuclide of thorium under the code beta decay, which gives us 3491. Protactinium, PA. Protactinium undergoes another beta decay. It 
give us uranium-234. And then we undergo two alpha decays after that. Oh, excuse me, three alpha decays after that. So we got 234-92 uranium gives us 4-2 plus 230-90, which is thorium again. And then thorium-92 undergo thorium-230, undergoes another alpha decay to give us 226-90, which is Excuse me, 88. Which we haven't used yet. It's going to be radium. And then radium should give us our final product. If we have done everything correctly with an alpha decay of 222. 86, it should be polonium. Six should be polonium. And I may have written this one wrong. Alpha, beta, alpha, alpha, alpha. Well, let me double check this. But this is Or is it positron emission? Maybe if you go plus one there, you get 90. I took this, I didn't write this question. I took this question. Let's see. If we got 23490. Thorium and we go positron and we end up with 89, 234 AC and then we got 234, 89 AC with 0, 1, which gives us 88. 234 radium and then we have 234 radium over 88 with alpha decay which gives us 230 86 polonium That can't be right. I, I'm not sure if I wrote these numbers down, but it should be uranium-238. Did I write the right values? Uranium should be 92, thorium-90, PA-91. Yeah, let me, let me take a look at that question. But based on the stepwise, because this, this can't be it, because you end up getting some like 82. And that's not right, because polonium is not 82. Something's wrong with this. This number is off somehow. 
And it might just be from the written of the question, but this will be an example of a chain. This is what you're going to be expected to be able to write step by step, not losing any track of any of the values, which I've double checked it. I don't think I've lost any. So. It just might be a typo. It should be 222 instead of 218. So you can just change that value to 222 in this worksheet, and you should be able to get that chain reaction. Where, again, each of these, this is alpha, beta, beta, alpha, alpha, alpha. And unless otherwise told, if you hear beta decay, this is going to be beta emission, right, which is going to be loss of the electron. I'm missing an alpha. One more alpha because uh, ADC is um, greater. Oh, it's RD. Yeah. yeah. So I'm missing a. I'm missing a. One trans. One more reaction. Okay. Cool. That's good. Y'all. Are... Oh, radon is RN, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, RN. RN. Not RD. Okay. 84 to 18 PO. Okay, yeah, cool. So I left something off. That's my fault. Excuse me. It should be four alphas, not three. So it should be four alphas, not three. Okay, good job. So, and, and that also may be a question. You might be asked to do this in reverse. What, my, what, nuclide did you start with if your result is lead? What did you start with, right? And you can work backwards. So you got to be able to work this forward and backwards. Either way, it's the same process over and over again. Or if I told you B minus, right? Electron uh, capture or positron emission, etc. Okay, now chemists and chemical engineers, particularly nuclear chemical engineers, they are almost always interested in transmutations by getting stuff to hit one another. Because some of these, and we'll talk about the kinetics here in a second, but some of these processes take hundreds and thousands of years to happen. We know that they occur, but they take hundreds of thousands of years to happen. So chemical engineers care a little bit more about the transmutations making them happen in the laboratory themselves. So a lot of the stuff that you see, right, uh, just recently, they added in, I think, four new elements, and whoever makes them and gets them to stay together for like nanosecond, they get to put their name on it, or they get to name it whatever they want to, right? So a lot of those were made using a neutron bombardment because the nucleus will actually accept the neutron because it's not charged, right? It doesn't bounce off and bounce away from the positively charged protons. So you can actually make stuff bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it will undergo different types of nuclear decay and create new elements. So uh, bombardment or the addition of neutrons almost always gives you a new element of a new isotope and then it almost always undergoes some decay. So I gave you nitrogen 14, which is, you know, our regular stable nitrogen. And if it undergoes neutron bombardment, like such, they give the example in the text, then we have a situation where we have one and zero, right? Because a neutron does not have a proton. It's only got one neutron, one mass number one. So that's going to give us 15, seven. We're still nitrogen because we haven't changed the atomic number. And then I said that that's followed by alpha emission, which is going to give us four, two, and boron five, 11. Simple. So this is just a transmutation.
considered a transmutation, not necessarily just a spontaneous decay, which is what all this, the other situation that we were talking about. This was essentially forced to occur. And you could also have this, uh, you know, eject a proton. In this case, they showed one where a proton is ejected. Protons ejected if he hit it with a helium nucleus. But this is the example that I gave you was nitrogen, neutron bombardment, creating a new nitrogen that is somewhat unstable, right? Because we have a ratio that's no longer one to one, and it undergoes, in this case, I picked alpha, but it also could undergo, of course. beta emission and go back to creating an oxygen, right? Or electron capture and create an oxygen. So it could, you still, regardless of which one is more likely, if I'm telling you what happens, you still just need to be able to write it. But if I'm asking you which is more likely to happen, obviously you base that on the band of stability. So I would go with this one if you would say which one was more likely to happen, right? If I gave you these two options, which one would you expect to be more likely? One of these two. Okay, now we want to talk a little bit about kinetics. So we're going back and applying what we learned from our kinetic chapter, right? Everybody's, I'm sure, long ready to be done with that, right? No, I'm joking. <laughs> so if we remember anything about our first order kinetics, and if we look at our reference materials, the first order kinetic rate law, we should remember, is natural log. Natural log of the concentration of A at time T is equal to negative KT plus natural log of the concentration of A at time zero, if I remember correctly. Okay, so when we're dealing with radioactive decay, all radioactive decay is first order kinetics, which means that it is a function of only one thing, and it is how much of the stuff we have and how much time it takes. Each individual radioactive species has its own rate constant. Remember, just like every single different chemical reaction has its own rate constant, right? And the rate constant K for a given first order kinetic, we should remember seeing this, and you're gonna be given this, if necessary, is gonna be 0 0.0592 over the half-life, whenever we're talking about half-life specifically. So all of the examples that we're given is half-life. This constant is for the half-life. And the reason for that, we, I went through that derivation earlier. All you have to know is just how to utilize this. But if you rearrange all of this, right, specifically, you should remember that you get You end up with natural log of AT over A naught is equal to negative KT. And that equation is what you're going to have to use when the time comes. But we're not dealing with concentration, right? We're not dealing with concentration. So when, when you see this equation in the nuclear portion, the nuclear equation is a function of amount, ratio of amount that you started with with amount that is left, right? So it's the exact same as 
ln of n at time t over n naught equal to negative kt. And remember, when we're dealing with half-life specifically, this constant holds always. So the half-life is not a function of anything other than the t. k is not a function of anything other than t when we're talking about kinetics of the first order. So if you got 50 grams of something and it has a half-life of two years, at two years you're going to have 25 grams. Two more years, you're going to have 12.5 grams. Two more years, right, you're going to have 6.25, et cetera, et cetera. So that process holds true. One reason that this is important is almost all of your carbon dating, radiocarbon dating, is a function of carbon-14, right? When you hear, oh, we found some fossils and we know how old they are. A lot of that has to do with carbon-14. Carbon-14 can only be created in the atmosphere, high energy. Carbon-14 is extremely unstable, but if it is incorporated into CO2, then the CO2 molecule, so if you take carbon-14 and make CO2, what ends up happening is that the CO2, so we take carbon-14, and that turns into CO2 that's using carbon-14, and where does CO2 go on the Earth? What's CO2 used for? Main purpose of CO2. Main use of CO2 is what? Plants, right. So CO2 is uptake by plants. Then what happens? Living things. Living things, no. What happens to the carbon? in the plants, living things eat the plants. Plants become food. Carbon-14 is then uptaken as in the carbohydrate form into the animal. And then it is put into your body. So when they do carbon dating for stuff that's old and mummies and things of that nature, they can look at the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, and they can determine how old it is. So that's where it comes from. It's a function of half-life. It's a function of the time. Because the half-life of carbon-14 to decay, we know. We know that value. So as long as we know that value, we can measure it. And that's where we're going to do some half-life calculations here in a second. So, but that's the reason for carbon dating. Here's the problem with carbon dating. It's not carbon-14's half-life is actually not that long, which means that if you go super far, if something is really, really old, then it's not enough carbon-14 left to date. So they have to use other techniques. When you're talking about fossils and rocks that are really old, they have to use heavy metal detection techniques, uranium, things of that nature, right? Because they were talking about some of the old, they've used, this is the science, whether you believe it or not, right? This is the science that has been used to determine the Earth's age, right? They've taken the rocks, they've smashed the rocks up, they've gotten the particular elements with half-life that we know, and they've measured that as a function of the kinetics, and they've determined that it's X amount of millions of years. They say the oldest rocks that have been measured thus far, somewhere in Australia. It has some kind of zirconium in it. Okay, so the example that I gave you is potassium is radioactive. Excuse me, I think I changed that. Cesium, right? Yeah. Cesium-137, radioactive. So we got CS-137. Fifty-five, and it has half-life of thirty point two years. So T equals one half thirty point two year it's a unit as necessary. And I think that this, there's a table that has this value for this particular one. Any any uh, values that you need for this are you going to be given, or you may have to be solving for it. So I ask you to determine the rate constant K. So, 
If I told you that K is equal to 0 0.0592, That is the wrong value. 693. I don't know why I did that. Change that. If you wrote the note down here, I don't know why I did 60.592. That's from the thermo chapter. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting con constants confused. That's from uh, electrochemistry, right? That's from the delta E equation. It's 0 0.693 over T1 half. Excuse me. Sorry about that. This is why memorizing stuff is no good. Use your reference materials. Okay, if we know it's 30.2, then this value is 0 0.693 over 30.2 years, and we get a value for K equal to, looks like I got 2.29 times 10 to the negative 3. And this is year to the negative 1. Remember our units for rate constant for First order is time to the negative one. So that's the first part of the question. Second part asks you, given a sample of 8.13 times 10 to the negative three moles of cesium-137, how much in kilograms will be left after 250 years? So you've been given number of moles. 8.31 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. I'm going to go look for some black marks right now, but this is where, since we are dealing with a specific nuclei, to determine the mass associated with this number of moles, what must we do? Or better question, why can't we use the value that's on the periodic table to determine the mass of this sample of season? Well, this is an isotope, but what is that on the periodic table? No, what, what it's value? An, it's, an it's an average of all of them. So since we're dealing with this specific nuclide of cesium, Right now, use the reference material to calculate the mass of one mole of this nuclei based on, and we're going to take, we're not going to take into consideration the mass defect, so just go ahead and calculate what one mole of this should be in atomic mass units. Again, you have to take into consideration protons, neutrons, and electrons. Cannot leave out electrons. Again, five sig figs is, is about all you need.
That's about what I got. Everybody got about 138. 0.1514, something like that. Okay, so if this is the amount of cesium that we have in this many, in this, excuse me, in this particular nuclide, right, then to get the mass that we have in this many moles, right, we need to multiply this by the number of moles which is 8.31 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of 137 cesium. And that is going to give us 8.31, 8 to the negative 3, 1.147, so essentially 1.1480 grams of this particular nuclide. All, right, all I'm doing is multiplying the molar mass of that nuclide, taking, not taking into consideration mass defect. And I will have to put that in the question if I give it to you, obviously, if it's not a mass defect question. I either have to give you the mass of that atom, or I have to tell you to disregard mass defect. Now we know how much cesium we started with, and now we want to know at 250 years how much we are left with. And I ask you to give it to me in kilograms, so you can convert this to kilograms now. Make it simple, 1.1480 times 10 to the negative 3 kilograms of cesium-137. And this is the value in, right? When we talk about this equation, in, this is in not, right? In not, so we are looking for NT. If we remember our mathematical manipulation, nt over n naught is equal to e raised to the negative kt. All I did was move natural log over. Now, if we are looking for nt, therefore it has to be equal to e raised to the negative kt times in not, and we have all of the values that we need, right? We were told uh, what 250. So our T is equal to 250 years, and E raised to the negative. 2.29 times 10 to the negative 3, year to negative 1, multiplied by 250 years, multiplied by 1.148 times 10 to the negative 3 kilograms, and we should have an answer in kilograms. As long as your ratio of N is in the same units, right, moles, kilograms, grams, AMUs, doesn't matter. As long as you have those units the same, then you're good to go in this equation. And you should have E to negative 2.29 E to the negative 3 times 250 times 1.148 E to the negative 3. And you're going to have a value after 250 years of 6.476 times 10 to negative 4 kilograms. So you've lost about 
Did I write it? This number is wrong? Sorry. I don't know why that number is wrong. It should be times 10 to the negative 2, not 3. This should be times 10 to the negative 2. Therefore, this number should be times 10 to the negative 2. Sorry. Don't know why I missed that. So it should be e raised to the negative second answer times 1.148 e to the negative 3 should be 9.99 times 10 to the negative 1 times 1.14 e to the negative 3. So yeah, that looks a little bit. Entering this in wrong. Hold on. Don't be in a hurry. 3.746 times 10 to the negative 6 should be the correct answer. And make sure when you plug it in the calculator into uh, the inverse of natural law, use parentheses to keep it together. But yes, this makes a little bit more sense. We've lost multiple orders of magnitude of mass because we have gone, if this is 30, right? 30 goes into 250 about eight times, right? eight point something. So we've done eight iterations of half lives, which is a half each time. So that is an example of a half life question given all of the information, right? Given all the information. So let's look at another example of a half life question working the other way. So uranium ore, which is one of the methods that they do to date rocks they can determine based on the amount of lead isotope that's found. So there's only certain isotopes of lead that are found in rocks that are not found in nature. Meaning there's only certain, they call it geonatural, I think, or geonormal. They're geonormal elements, and then there are ones that are a function of decay processes. So lead 206, if you look on a periodic table, right, lead's uh, average is 207. So the isotope of lead 206 is really not one that has much natural abundance. It's one that's a function of radioactivity and decay. So what they've decided is that if you can look at the ratio of the lead in the rock, Based and the ratio of the uranium, you can determine the age of the rock because the lead had to come from the uranium. So if it's a one-to-one -one process from a conservation molar perspective, then that ratio of Ln of Nt over N0 equal negative Kt. In this example, we can look at the ratio of uranium and they gave us, in this case, uh, 5.37 milligrams and 2.52 milligrams. So we can look at the ratio of the total number of moles and the number of moles left. So we can go total moles here. <clears throat> And then, <clears throat> I 
This is total moles left, and this is total moles equals negative KT. So what I did here, and I'm going to just go ahead and um, do, uh, I just quickly did the math, 239.9 is that what I used? I did that 5.37 times 10 to the negative 3 grams divided by 239.9 grams per mole. I went ahead and did the math on this so that, I, so that you didn't have to. And then you get the number of moles of uranium. <clears throat> and this value was 2.24 times 10 to the negative 5 moles of uranium and for our lead 2.52 times 10 to the negative 3 grams all over that particular isotope is 207.7 grams per mole and that gives me something on the order of 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5 1.21 times 10 to the negative 5 moles of this lead. So lead 206 and this is uranium 234 238 excuse me. Okay so the first question is why did I do this? Well in a half-life situation if all of the lead had to come from uranium only, right? The only source of this had to come from there. Then to get the ratio of total moles that we started with, to get that value, we have to add these together, right? We have to add these numbers of moles together, right? Because when we're working in moles, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? It's a one-to-one -one ratio. So if we add these together, we can say that the total number of moles of uranium-238 that we started with has to equal 2.24 times 10 to the negative 5 moles plus 1.21 times 10 to the negative 5 moles and that is equal to 3.45 times 10 to the negative 5 Moles. So this is bringing back a little bit of understanding of, you know, just basic stoichiometry that if the decay process, which we know has to be one to one, then the number of moles of lead had to come from moles of uranium and there are other things that are being decayed, right? Alpha particles, beta decay, etc. So this is total moles, so this is going to be NT. And the moles of uranium left is here, right? They gave us the half-life 4.5 times 10 to the negative not 10 to the 9 years. So to determine K, 0 0.693, 693, all over the half-life, 4.5. Four point five times ten to the positive nine years, and this gives us a K value one point five four times ten to the negative ten year to the negative one. And remind me to pass back. I have you all's quiz. I don't know why they just hit me. Remind me to pass that back to you before y'all leave. So if we have K, we have N T. This is N naught. T will give us how old, if we solve this equation for T, we'll now know how old our particular sample is. So T is equal to ln of NT over N naught, all divided by negative K. All I did was just manipulate that. So we get natural log of 3.45 times 10 to the negative 5 over 2.24 times 10 to the negative 5 
all over 1.54 times 10 to the negative 10 year to negative 1. Remember, natural logs have no units, so we are left with the units of years, which is what we want. And this ends up giving us 3.45. And really, remember, since this ratio is, they both have the same right exponent, you can really just divide it by 2. You don't have to use that. Equals divided by, this should be negative. Don't forget that. Divided by negative 1.54 e to the negative 10. Oh, I got them flipped. I'm sorry. So, off the day a little bit. So, NT does not stand for total. Total moles need to be N not right at time zero excuse me on that n not is at time zero which will be total moles of everything together n t will be moles at whatever time length that we're dealing with and that's what we're solving for in this case this is at t equal to zero sorry so this needs to be flipped it should be two two four over 3.45. The reason you know that is because you get a negative value and you can't have a negative number of times. So let's do that one more time. 2.24e divided by 3.45 divided by negative 1.54e to negative 10. And you get a really big number, 2.8. Zero five times ten to the nine years. So we're talking about millions of years. But the, the key to this problem, a lot of people are going to not be able to convert to moles and to understand that the total number of moles should be conserved because the lead can only come from source of uranium. So you'll have some more kinetics uh, problems. Um, I won't be talking too much about the application side of nuclear chemistry. We just, I mean, you've already got really enough situations. That last question is a fusion problem, which nuclear fusion is extremely energetic. And if we could control it, we would actually have no energy issues on the planet whatsoever but it is very, very tough, right? Um, nuclear fusion was used in the, in the bombs, and that uh, we know is, is, the purpose of that is for it not to be controlled. So the last question, you should be able to, to answer that using the mass defect equation, E equals MC squared. Um, but that will be the extent of what I will ask of you on the assessment. I will be, again, updating the problem set when you pass out, you get out quit. I will be updating the problem set. That problem set will have chem, thermo, 
e-chem, and nuclear. Tests will be over these three on Monday. Any questions that you have, obviously, 